Well, hello, everybody. My name is Dennis Levin, and I'm the uh, retired pastor at Queen Street United Methodist Church in Kinston, North Carolina. I want to welcome you to our Bible study today. We're going to be finishing up chapter 34 and going very quickly through the final chapters of Exodus. Um, so I want to, uh, I just want to give you a heads up that the, uh, the final sprint to the end is going to be um, pretty quick. Um, we uh, ended at uh, verse 21 in chapter 34, and uh, this is when Moses is coming down from the mountains, mountain, and um, uh, he's giving a renewal of the covenant. So, uh, again, we see this whole thing about the Sabbath day. On verse 21, you see, six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, even in plowing time and in the harvest time you shall rest. You shall observe the festival of weeks, the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the festival of ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times in the year your male shall appear before the Lord your God, the Lord God, excuse me, the Lord God, the God of Israel. For I will cast out nations before you and enlarge your borders. No one shall covet your land while you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times a year. So what God is saying to the people is that... Um, Three times a year, all the males have to present themselves, but don't worry, you're not going to be attacked during those three times that they come out. Um, contrast that with the events even today. This is the uh, 7th of October, and um, today there has been a massive attack on Israel, and it was done during their holiday season. So what uh, what is said here? Um, has uh, been contradicted by what's going on today, that Israel and on Yom Kippur war, which I'm very familiar with, um, <clears throat> Israel's been attacked on its high holy days and, um, and during times of celebration. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is an aberration. And what's happening today in Israel is not only a travesty, it's a, um, it's a disaster for the whole Middle East. And you're going to see this uh, this war expanding. So uh, just want you to know that uh, Israel is still under threat. You shall not offer the blood of my, of my sacrifice with leaven. Well, that leaves me out of it. And the sacrifice uh, and the sacrifice of the festival of the Passover shall not be left until morning. Well, this is these are edicts that went right along with the initial institution of Passover. The best of your first fruits of your ground you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Um, this is uh, kosher, and it's um, uh, kosher means that you're not going to be including blood in as uh, as part of the uh, as part of the meal. And this uh, idea of not boiling a kid in its mother's milk is something about the sanctity of life. And uh, and there, uh, in kosher homes, there's um, uh, a separation between meat and dairy. Uh, the dishes that are used, the, the uh, cooking utensils, everything has to be separate so that there's no mixing of, uh, of meat and dairy in the off event that you're mixing uh, a kid and its mother's milk. The Lord said to Moses, write these words for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. He was there with the day of the Lord, 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets, the words of the covenant, the 10 commandments. All right. <clears throat> Where do you see a parallel to this in the new Testament? Well, you see a parallel to this when Jesus went off into the wilderness and went 40 days, 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water. Uh, you see it with Elijah. Uh, 40, of course, is uh, not a specific number. It's a time of trial. And, uh, and that's what the number 40 represents. Numbers in the, in the Old Testament um, are more symbolic than they are actual. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, he was on the mountain a long time. And during that time, he apparently was supernaturally sustained. Okay, now this one is uh, this one's kind of interesting. It's um, it's about Moses coming down from the mountain. What's this guy like? You know, we 
from time to time have uh, have experiences with God, and um, and we want to share that experience, or we want to describe the experience. And uh, if you really had an encounter with the Almighty, uh, it defies uh, description. It describes a verbal description. So something is happening with Moses. Moses came down from the mount from Mount Sinai as he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand. Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him and Moses spoke with them. All right, where do we see a parallel to this in the New Testament? Well, we see a parallel to this in the um, um, the transfiguration of the Lord. And there's Moses again. But Jesus shines. There is a, a glow about him that is visible. And, uh, it's you know, people sometimes get unnerved by this kind of thing. I guess they should. Uh, it's just something that has an easy, that defies easy expl- explanation. But um, Moses' face shone, and because the people couldn't explain it, or it was uh, just not something that normally happens, um, first response is to kind of get away from it. And so the people are dismayed when they see Moses coming down. But they know that Moses, because his face is shining, uh, that he has actually been talking to God. Something is different about Moses when he comes down the mountain. So they, the people say, what Moses is talking about here is absolutely something that, uh, that God spoke to him. And you can see the physical evidence of it in the fact that the man has a glow about him. All right. <clears throat> When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in, oh, and I need to, I need to, I need to share this with you. Okay, um, the word for shining and the word for horn are about the same in uh, in the Hebrew, from what I've read. And uh, when you look at the picture that Michelangelo painted of Moses, he's got horns in that picture. Um, because there was a mis- misinterpretation of the word for shining. So in Michelangelo's depiction of Moses, his face doesn't shine. He's got horns. He looks almost like a devil. Um, but horns also imply uh, wisdom. So there's there's that also uh, that you can look at in the, you know, in the references. But the translation... Uh, well, let's, let's just say that Michelangelo wasn't necessarily the best linguist when he did his painting. All right. <clears throat> when Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses that the skin of his face was shining and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. So what you have is somebody who is sharing in the glory and the light of God and the only time you see something like that again is in the New Testament with Christ. So like I say, there are a lot of parallels between Christ and Moses. Um, You know, Christ goes into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, doesn't eat, doesn't drink. Uh, Christ has the the transfiguration, the the glowing face, and, and, uh, and it's overwhelming to the people around him as the uh, experience of transformation was overwhelming to the disciples that he took up the mountain with him. Um, <clears throat> then you have this other part where there's this, uh, this veil comes on and off and, uh, and it's, it's almost like the, um, oh, what do you, 
the incarnation of Christ, where on the one hand, there's got to be a veiling of God, the glory of God, when Jesus is talking face to face with people. And so they see him as human, okay? But when he's speaking to God, it's, uh, it's a, a, you know, a direct, it's family. It's just family. Okay, so let's move on now. Chapter 35. Here's the Sabbath regulation again, okay? <clears throat> Moses assembled all the congregation of the Israelites and said to them, These are the things that the Lord commanded you to do. Six days shall you work be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a holy Sabbath. So six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a holy Sabbath of solemn rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on, the, on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire in all your dwellings on the Sabbath day. That part's new. But basically he's saying you're not going to work, and, uh, and that includes housework. So even the women are exempt from doing work on the Sabbath. How about that? Okay. Moses said to all the congregation of the Israelites, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded Take from among you an offering of the Lord to the Lord. Let ever who is of generous heart bring the Lord's offering gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and crimson yarns, and fine linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, and fine leather, acacia wood oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, uh, and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and gems to be set in the ephod and the breastplate. All right, let's stop here for a minute. <clears throat> From now on until the end in chapter 40, the end of Exodus, everything that is in here is a description of how the people are building everything that was described as the specifications for the tabernacle that were presented earlier. So what you have here is a reiteration. And as I said earlier, when you go into all the details of what's in the tabernacle and the things that they made and all this, this is basically a police report. This is this is telling the Persians these are the kinds of things that the Babylonians stole from Jerusalem, and it's in some warehouse over there in Babylon. And when we go back to Jerusalem, we need to take it with us because this is stolen property. And so not only do you have a specification for what goes into the tabernacle, but you also have, um, you know, a description of the things that the people are constructing, what they're making. And, uh, and who's making them. And all of this is to reinforce the, uh, the idea that this is originally their property that the Babylonians took. So I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail on, <clears throat> on, the, on the final chapters of Exodus. I think we can, you know, you can go through that and wind it up. But basically what you're saying is, oh, God said build this and here are the people building it. There are some glitches in it, though. Like, for instance, when Moses, before Moses went up to the mountain, what did he take from the people so that they could not make another golden calf? He took all their adornments. But now he comes down the mountain and he says, hey, anybody who wants to give it up, give it up and uh, and we'll put it in the in the temple. We'll put it in the tabernacle. And uh, and so you have all these items, all these adornments, um, gold and silver and all of these things that ostensibly had already been surrendered to Moses before he went up the mountain. But like I say, when you look at uh, the Old Testament historically, you can't look at it the same way that you look at a modern historical record. Modern historical record is cross-referenced and footnoted and, um, you know, there are pictures and, and things like that. I know that as a, as a military historian on the battlefield, I had to uh, I had to catalog every photograph that I took, where it was and who it was of and what it was of and um, and the day and, you know, what kind of film and, uh, all of that. And, you know, for my team, I had to specify who on my team was taking the picture. And then if you had documentation, you had to demonstrate where that documentation came from, that these were official records. Um, 
when you had artifacts out there, you couldn't just pick up a thing. You had to say what it was, where you got it, what day you got it, under what circumstances you got it. You couldn't, you couldn't like, for instance, we have, we have photographs of, uh, of helicopters that were captured and those helicopters are now in museums in the army. And, um, but this is the, we had, we had a record of where that helicopter was when it was captured. So, you know, precisely this really was an Iraqi helicopter. <clears throat> and, um, and it was, um, you know, given to them by the Russians. So this is, this is the kind of thing we, we have to be very precise in our histories today. In old Testament times, there wasn't any kind of a, a historical standard to go by authorship, uh, time of writing, um, consistency with previous statements of what went on, don't have to have to comply with each other. Uh, there's no footnoting or anything like that, because what you're taking is a collection of oral histories. In some cases, documented histories, sometimes documented in two different places where the documents don't match. And uh, and you're putting all this together and you're not leaving anything out. The idea is you don't leave anything out, okay? So whether it's correct or incorrect, it it goes in there and you figure it out. You figure it out, okay? So with this, you have you figure it out because the people are bringing all these things, and apparently they are filthy rich. They are bringing all the mo the the most expensive fabrics. They're bringing the most expensive jewels. They're bringing the most expensive metals, the most expensive wood. All of this is being brought by a people who ostensibly are being fed with manna and quail. And, um, you know, some of the things that are being brought, like for instance, tanned leather and things like that. Those are not things that nomads do. You have to have a tanning facility. If you're going to work metal, you have to have a forge. Um, if you're going to be spinning fabric, then you have to have looms. And, and nomads don't drag these things around in the desert. They just don't. These things come from settled communities. And so the, the description of what is here and what's being made and everything is not something that people in the wilderness can just do or build on the fly. It has to come, the, the artisanship has to come from a settled community. So there's a discrepancy there. The, uh, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and all of these things probably were a lot rougher in the, during the phase of the Exodus. But as the people became settled, of course, they, they brought in improvements over and over again. And, uh, and that's what's going on. Um, I really don't want to go into all the detail of how these things were built. It's, it, it's, and, and you know, how the people did their generosity was very good. They brought more than was necessary. Moses had to tell them to stop bringing stuff, but essentially all you have down here is a reiteration of what we had before and how it was made. So <clears throat> I'm going to, I'm going to kind of leave it at that. Um, and, uh, we are going to, while we leave Exodus, we are not necessarily in the promised land yet. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to pull the class and see which way you want to go on this. Uh, if you want to go directly into Leviticus, which is um, a lot of legalities, or if you want to go into Deuteronomy, which has legalities, but it also has an awful lot of history uh, mixed in with it. So um, you may want, you know, we. This is a historical narrative, and Deuteronomy kind of picks up the history of it, and then that's carried forward into Joshua. Um, <clears throat> so we can I'll, – I'll leave it to the class where we want to go from here. But uh, I've enjoyed the study of Exodus very much, and I hope it's been informative. There's an awful lot in Exodus that we've been able to process and, and bring into a, a, a contemporary context. And, uh, and we should be doing that with all the Bible. The Bible – we had a discussion uh, because there's <laughs> we brought out in this study that there are so many flaws in the biblical record. 
that people who have been taught that the word of God is infallible all their lives were wondering, well, what is it infallible or not? Okay, is this the uh, inspired word of God? If you look at the inspired word of God as being entirely infallible, you're going to be sorely disappointed throughout the Bible, not just in the Old Testament. You're going to find it in the New Testament. You're going to find discrepancies all along the way, which is a good thing. The Bible was not written all at once, and it wasn't written by one person, and it wasn't written with one interpretation or one set of circumstances. The Bible covers thousands of years of history, different circumstances, different people, different cultures. The cultures change dramatically throughout the biblical time period. And um, and so when you're looking at, at reading scripture, you have to understand that The New Testament doesn't have to always match the Old Testament, but it couldn't have been written without the Old Testament. You had to have the baseline of the Old Testament to work on the New. Um, you had to. You have to also understand the cultures and the issues that were being confronted when people wrote these things down, and um, and at what point they can be officially compiled into what we call our Bible. A lot of complications in there. Is it, it, is it the inspired word of God? I, I believe it is. That's not that I'm saying that it doesn't have flaws. It does. Um, so I look at the Bible as the inspiring word of God. Because since I've, since I've come to understand and appreciate Scripture uh, the way I do, I'm finding that the Bible challenges me to raise questions. OK, and it also provides for me a lot of the answers. OK, but I also question a lot of the answers. <laughs> so I consider the Bible the inspiring word of God because it inspires me to think, not just to accept. I don't I'm, I'm, I'm terrible that I, I, I memorized an awful lot of Bible, but I did it in my youth. In, uh, in professional studies and stuff, I didn't memorize the Bible. I found I memorized where I could find stuff. Okay. But if you ask me to quote scripture, I'm probably not that good at it. Um, but there are people who can quote scripture who still don't understand it. Because they don't give it any thought. They just take it word for word. So... I'd rather understand it than be able to show you my my biblical acumen by being able to quote you chapter and verse about things. Um, I can read the chapters. I can read the verses. I can find the chapters. I can find the verses. I have tools to do that. And, uh, and it's not that hard these days to find what you're looking for in the scripture. You don't have to go through the whole thing page by page in order to find things anymore. We have quick ways of picking up where you want to go and who said what and when and, uh, and all about how as well. So <clears throat> I want you to be inspired by the word of God, inspired to think, inspired to ask questions, inspired to see whether or not uh, an edict for an ancient people should apply in a modern age. Should we accept genocide? Should we accept slavery? Should we accept? And are there remedies for these things that you find in Scripture that you feel like God is speaking to us and saying, okay, you have these options, but don't do this and don't do that. And these are things you should do, not because you're required to by law, but because you're because you love your maker. You love Christ. OK. You do it because of the relationship that you have with God. And uh, and how do you how do you find out more about the relationship? Well, you you read the you read the word of God and you get a you get a, an understanding of how God is taking people. Not just from one place to another, but where God is taking people from a mindset to a new 
I hate this word paradigm, uh, how to think, how to think, how to act, how to, how to be a better person, how to be a better culture. All of this is in your scripture. And, uh, and I hope that the, the lessons that we've had from Exodus um, will challenge you as they should. So God bless you. You have a wonderful day. And, uh, and I look forward to seeing you soon. I'm not going to be in class this coming Sunday because I've been invited to preach in Enfield United Methodist Church, one of my old parishes from way back. And, uh, and finally, they got up enough nerve to ask me to come home and, and to preach to them again. I guess it's safe by now. But uh, I feel like, you know, I feel like Jacob coming home to Esau. We'll see, we'll see what happens. <laughs> okay, well, God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. And, uh, and we'll see where, where we go next.